Welcome to the podcast of Power, a show where we discuss the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. I'm your host, Mike White. Joining me, of course, is Mr. Chris Dashu. You know what? You forgot my wedding. You forgot my children. It's been 20 years for me. I lived a lifetime. And for you, it was in the blink of an eye. This episode, we we're talking about Adrift, which premiered the same night as A Shadow of the Past but we wanted to break this up a little bit better than they broke up the season premiere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th- this definitely should have should have been one episode. Yeah. 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 I think so. I right. Think so. It feels like one episode. It definitely does, especially because it picks up exactly where the last one left off. Right. So at the end of the last episode, Galadriel jumps off the boat to the Grey Havens and says, I'm not going. And then she's in the water. All episode, all episode. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's she's on a boat a little bit. But I mean, she's in, she's on the water. Like she never makes land. Like the end of the episode has a introduction of a character. I guess introduces a character that's going to be a pretty big deal with for the show moving forward. But Galadriel is adrift all episode, hence the title. So it's a weird episode because our main character is just hanging out in the water so the, everything kind of shifts away from her which i appreciate which is also why this feels so weird it should have just been one whole episode because this two episodes really tell one whole story i feel mm-hmm. well and this one ends on a little bit of a cliffhanger as well so i guess we're gonna end every episode like that perhaps i guess i don't i don't know again you know what's weird about this show is because this show was purchased five seasons that's what they're doing no questions they laid out a billion dollars for this show they know how the show ends they know where the show is going so i don't i guess i understand doing these cliffhangers but there's no need i mean to hype us up for next week but again that was like a terrestrial television model thing right Mm -hmm. I, i don't know i mean i feel like if you're invested in the show after the second episode, you're going to watch the third episode. Like, why wouldn't you? It doesn't cost anything. It's just on Amazon. And essentially, everybody has Amazon. So I don't mind giving us a little bit of a cliffhanger. It's kind of that little bump that you get at the sure. end of the chapter. You know, sure. it's like that's fair. And he would never know what would happen that fateful day. And then boop, chapter two. Right. And I mean, you know, again, I I get it it works from a storytelling standpoint of like, this is the way it's always been done. So why would we do anything different? And Mm -hmm. yeah, it does, like you said, kind of give you a little bit of like, oh, there's a little teaser of something. But yeah, I mean, again, the episode, the next episode comes out at the end of this week, we're going to be watching it. So it's like, again, it's just giving us more of something to chew on for like a week, less like really anything else, which is what normal TV did, obviously, back in the day. But again, this is just a little different because they don't really have to worry about being canceled or not making it to the end of the run of the show or not knowing where the show is going. This is a unique scenario to be in if you're the showrunners because you know you've got five seasons which is very weird like i mean that might not sound weird to you dear listener but that is not the way tv works for the most part they spend a billion dollars five years this show is being made like that's that's it like even game of thrones the pilot for that show was re recast and reshot completely. Like, you know, even the biggest shows, the biggest shows, contemporary shows, even they weren't sure things. This is a sure thing. And this is happening. Like this is happening. That's Amazon paid a billion dollars. It's happening. It's, it's kind of a weird thing in a way. I kind of like it though, because I've said before that I think most of the best shows really should end after five seasons and that the ones that stick around longer tend to run out of steam. I mean, I, I don't remember how many seasons The Wire had, but that was kind of like a perfect TV show. The first five years of Supernatural were fucking fantastic, and then it shit the bed after that. When first four years they, of Dexter were pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think five is about the right number. And then you get other, of course, there's, you know, people yelling at me uh, on the radio saying like, oh, well, don't forget about. I don't know, Seinfeld or MASH or some of these other shows. It's like, okay, great. Yeah, that that's fine. But I would say for the most part, shows really run out of steam after about five years. I agree. I mean, as someone who's a fan of some shows that have stuck around way too long, <laughs> X-Files, 
And and supernatural. I mean, I was watching that show until season seven or eight. And I yeah, you're right. I mean, those later seasons of that show are for are for fans of the show only, which yes. is fun, which is perfectly fine. Uh-huh. But again, that show is a example that I would pit this against. That show almost got canceled like at the end of every season. Uh-huh. This show will never have to worry about that. And there are few shows in the history of contemporary TV like this. And again, it's because of the budget of this fucking show. It's a billion dollar show. And you know what? It looks it. It like in this episode, man, it really when they go into Casa Doom, I was I was beyond impressed. I don't know about you. It looked really good. Yeah. Right? It's like yeah. it was like watching the movie. It was like watching The Hobbit. Yeah, it was interesting though, some of the things that they had going, which are probably, you know, true to the story, the whole idea of like elevators and things. I'm like, oh, that, that's kind of cool. We don't really get to ever see those because by the time we get to the Lord of the Rings, most of that stuff is kind of shut down. Right. Well, I mean, they go to Moria in they Fellowship. Call it a mine. Right. And they go in there and it's just barren, you know, a complete uh, tomb, a tomb under the mountain. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, you know, you the I guess the only thing you really see in Lord of the Rings, at least the films, are the cities of man and the cities of the elves. And then in The Hobbit, we see Erebor in the flashbacks in the first Hobbit movie. And then, I mean, we're in Erebor in the second and third movie. But we, like you've said, we never get to see the dwarf cities like this. Right. Yeah. Which is really exciting. Again, like I was again, it's it's interesting to see them completely destroyed, but it's hard to imagine what they looked like without it. But now we're getting to see that again. And it's it's interesting. Yeah. And, you know, last week I talked about how we didn't really see any familiar faces. And this episode makes a liar out of me because we get to see Peter Mullen in here as the uh, what Durin the third, basically Prince Durin's dad, King Durin at this point. Yeah, he's, um, you know, I remember him from Westworld where he plays the father that like the who created Delos and he I mean, you know, I don't want to spoil that if nobody's if you haven't seen it. And I know you and I have differing opinions on that show, so I won't give my opinion, but he's a really good actor. We only oh, get to God, see him yes. a little bit here. I hope we get to see him a lot more. But talk about just like immediate gravitas when he's on screen. You can just tell like he just I don't know. There's something about him that he's he's just a really charismatic actor. Yeah, I mean, I've talked about him a few times because we did an episode and I did a commentary for Session 9, and he's fucking fantastic in that. There's one movie of his called Tyrannosaur that I really want to see. It's um, a Patty Considine movie. Yeah, he's barely in Children of Men, but my goodness, does he make an impression? Yeah, I was really glad. And it took me, really, he's almost rec- unrecognizable in uh rings of power it's really the voice that clued me in i was just like oh i know that voice from you know from my dreams right no he's he's fantastic and again you know we get a little bit more of lenny henry in this episode as well speaking of actors who bring gravitas immediately by being in this Uh we get him a little bit more too which is nice we get to see more of the harfoots and markella cavanaugh's nori which i mean again i I don't know where it's going. I think they've more or less now with the way they interacted with the stranger. I think it's more or less confirmed as to who that's going to be. Right. I think last week we were talking about, oh, we think it's who it is. I think now it's like, who else would it be? Yeah. I mean, it's got to be Tom Bombadil. There's no damn it again. (laughs) (laughs) Again, he says it. It's Radagast, clearly, because he's wearing a gray cloak. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I believe Gandalf coming into the story this early is not what Tolkien wrote. But again, I would preface any of that by saying this is technically a prequel to the movies. Oh, good Lord. I've been right? on that. Is it not? L-O- is, is it well, not? It, yeah, basically. But I've been on those LOTR, uh, you know, like the Reddit group. Oh, my God. They are just they are so full of themselves. They're, they're worse than Elon Musk with just the way that they're tearing this show apart. I'm like, guys. Just relax. Enjoy it. It's a TV show. What, what's the big deal? I don't know. They're, they're making, again, like I interpret this show as a prequel to the films. So if people had problems with the films, I'm not sure this show is going to fix those issues. Oh, no. But it's also not going to take away from the movies because, you know, 
This is 5,000 years before. Like, what what do you care? This story has not been told. And yes, I know Amazon didn't get the rights to the Silmarillion, but they're using all the appendices stuff. That's fine. But like getting pissed off about this show, especially the things that they're getting pissed off about, which some of it, it's just like the usual Internet troll racism shit. Uh, But like, you know, because I don't want to give them a platform or any of their bullshit, an an ability to get into our show because has no place here. You would agree, I'm sure. Oh, 100 percent. But like, yeah, I had I was on that subreddit, too. And it's just like, guys, fucking shit. Episode two. Like, what has this show done to offend you already? Like, really? Like what? Like, what has it done so far where it's like, I have a problem with this show completely? At its core, at a molecular level, I hate this show. And it's like, I don't know what show you're watching where you are like this offended this early. But even the second episode still, I think, is holding that magic and feeling of the original movies. It still kind of has it. And it's building on it, too, which I also appreciate because, again, like my really biggest concern with this show has been capturing the tone of the original movies. And I think it's still, I think it's still kind of nailing it even in this second episode, especially when we're seeing like the stuff with the Harfoots. Like, I don't know. It's very evocative. It it evokes Peter Jackson's movies, kind of the hobbits almost more than Lord of the Rings. Yeah. But I still like that. (laughs) Well, there is that (laughs) so far. I mean, you know, we're two episodes in, I'm enjoying this and I'm cutting it a lot of slack. So, right. I, like, why wouldn't you? Yeah. I don't, I, I, again, like, I, I don't, I don't know what anyone has seen at this point that's like such an affront. You know, the back and forth between Durin and Elrond, that scene is fantastic. That's a great establishing scene for Durin, for the Prince Durin character. And to give you more of like, you know, because Elrond, I think up until that point, has kind of been a little stodgy. And now you're getting to see that, yeah, he is not just this emotionless elf. He, right. you know, he can be sympathetic and empathetic with, you know, because again, like to Dur- you know, Durin's point, like, the you know, 20 years is a long time. Like, oh, sorry, like elves are immortal. Yeah. Right. I mean, I know dwarves age at a slower rate, but yeah, to miss the wedding, to miss the birth of his two kids, all that stuff. I I mean, I can really empathize with them. Right. And so I thought that was really, I thought that was a great moment. And I thought the stuff going on with, with uh, Duran's wife and everything, I was just like, yeah, this is really nice. I like this. It really does a lot to humanize those characters quickly. You, I mean, again, like you're, You're with Elrond going through these kind of feelings of like, why is the prince not, you know, recognizing him or pretend or he's pretending like he doesn't know him. He keeps referring to him as the elf. And, you know, Elrond is telling Celebrimbor, oh, you know, they're going to, you know, welcome us like friends. Good friends are going to be, you know, pork pies to the ceiling or whatever. And then that that's not what happens. So it's a really interesting scene because, again, like you go all the way through that scene and then they tell you the kind of punchline to the joke when the scene has already ended. And I appreciate that they not tension, but they really build that back and forth between those characters and then they let it off right at the perfect moment. It's it's really well done TV writing. I'm kind of surprised oh. in a way. Like it's it was it was a really humanizing moment in a show that again these aren't human characters. So, you know, you don't expect them to be saying like I'm mad about my wedding. Like no, there right. wasn't any of that in the original Lord of the Rings. There was none of these like weird like humanistic moments. Like th- there kind of are, but like this this is a different kind. I don't know how to, how else to explain it. Right, right. Well, a lot of the characters, especially the elves, they were, I mean, I watched Amadeus recently and they're talking about, oh, you should make operas about, you know, these gods and all these, you know, mythological creatures. And he's like, you know, I don't want to deal with people that look like they would shit marble. It's like, I want to deal with the real people and I want to have real conversations. And that's what this feels like. It doesn't feel like, you know, I can, I, my complaint in the last episode was it doesn't feel that kind of weighty in the language. And I think I'm getting used to it with this. And I think I'm getting okay with this being more of a natural language. At least they're not peppering like weird um, colloquialisms or just even like modern day phrasing. I mean, thank God for that. Right. Thank goodness. It isn't just like, Oh, you got canceled Gandalf or any of that kind of stuff. So, and by the way, I should say real quick, it's not Duran's wife. It's Disa. I should actually like give the woman a name. So uh, who I really, I thought that she was delightful in that role. 
I was about to say, I think she walked away with the episode. Yeah. yeah. 100%, right? Like, fantastic. And again, I don't, I really don't know most of the actors in this show. We talked about it last time. I mean, again, we both consider ourselves rather knowledgeable in film and knowing who actors are. But, you know, sometimes they're able to really cast outside of our realms of knowledge. I mean, a lot of these actors are like stage actors or have worked on like small television shows, kids shows even with uh, Sofia Nomvede, who plays Disa. But she steals every scene that she's in. I mean, she's fantastic. I can't wait to see her character again. Like it, you know, the dwarfs are 100% the best part of this show so far for me. They, they've edged out the Harfoots because again, like those, the dwarf characters are almost the least explored characters of all the Lord of the Rings characters. Yeah. Like at least the races. I mean, yes, they're in the Hobbit, but like we mentioned in our last episode, yeah, they're in the Hobbit, but so what? They're barely, they, they barely do anything with them. Right. And they're so interchangeable that it's like, you know, oh, it's the fat one. It's the skinny one. It's the one, this one with the weird shit in his beard and the, the one with the, know, axe the in his head. His ear. Yeah. It's like, who gives a shit? Like they were so interchangeable. I mean, they were, they were good when I read the Hobbit and they were, I mean, they were great when I read the Hobbit, when I was, you know, in seventh grade or whatever, they're great. If you're telling your kid a story and they kind of fit in with like the seven dwarves, those kind of things. But as movie characters, they needed more or they needed, they needed more character or they needed fewer dwarves, which I know is anathema to people to be like, Oh my God, how could dare you change the number of dwarves? I'm a huge Keeley Stan, you know, it's okay. You know, they needed something more to their characters rather than just being like the walking stereotypes that they were. And I think that the show so far is doing a lot to rectify that, at least mm-hmm. with these dwarf scenes. Cause again, we've, we've seen a lot. I mean, we've seen the elf cities, we've seen a region, but they haven't lingered on stuff like they did in the dwarf city. And again, it feels like a calculated effort to give the dwarfs the attention that they kind of haven't gotten in the last six anything i mean again we're in moria but moria is destroyed we go to erebor but erebor is destroyed that's that for me is a lot more it's like again like i'm on board with everything else for the show but really for me the dwarfs are the reason i'm gonna keep sticking around every week because Mm -hmm. they're just an underrepresented species in this universe as it's been presented in the films and some of the best characters have been dwarves gimli i mean again john reese davies don't have to say anything about him other than he's one of the best parts of those movies. But again, there are so many good parts of those movies. It's almost unfair, but the, the actors who are playing the dwarves are already taking what little the show is giving them. Cause it is a packed show and really running away with it. Right. And the, to your point from earlier, these dwarves feel like they're taking their look from the Hobbit. I mean, during with that crazy beard, which is almost like a, like one dreadlock type of thing. Right. That feels very much like Bilbo's party. You know, I'm glad that they're keeping some of the look and feel of these characters. They look very different than, you know, Gimli, which is okay. You know, Gimli walking around with one of those big ass beards or, you know, an, (laughs) an ax in his head or some shit like that would have just been completely wrong for that character. So it's not a retrofit. It basically is, it's fitting in with the lore that they've already kind of started to create. Well, in the, fe- I mean, in the fellowship, yeah, obviously all the races at the time are present in the fellowship, but they're not like, they're so not indicative of those races that they're representing. They're almost at least in Legolas's case and somewhat in Gimli's case, but not so much, but definitely in Legolas, you're like, you're, you are going against the expectation of those characters. Like the elves like they don't act that way. They're not like they're they're, they're not jokey. And you kind of see that in everything else. Like no other elves are as jokey as Legolas is with Gimli ever, right. like ever. That's I mean, like Elrond and Doran in this kind of get close. That is that is the closest I think we've seen since is like that back and forth in this episode where it's like these two. I believe these two are friends and I can see why even if they've kind of come to a head. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't believe we've talked all this time and we haven't talked about Shai Halud. Oh, right. What was going <laughs> on? Uh, so is that a sea dragon then? Well, 
I wasn't even talking about the dragon, the sea dragon. I was talking about whatever's burrowing underneath all of those cottages. Oh yeah. As soon as they 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 saw that tunnel, I was just like, oh, it was a sandworm must have made that tunnel. And when they found like a little, it was either a tooth or a nail. I was just like, oh, it's a Chris knife. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what wasn't there something in the Hobbit like that, like some sort of like sand yeah. thing? Yeah, right uh, towards the end of the that awful third movie. Yes. Right. So that's uh, that's what I thought. Like I was like, they've introduced that already, and I know in the Shadow of War, the Middle Earth video game that I mentioned that had Kella Brimbor's story being introduced to a, a different audience before this one. Like they're in that too, I think. So it'll be interesting to see if they show them on screen for the first time. I kind of assume that they will. Mm-hmm. I mean, again, they've got the budget. They have the budget. <laughs> right. If anything they've got, it's the budget. So I don't know. I, I will tell you, though, they made orcs scary for the first time in like ever because orcs yeah. have not really ever been scary. That was very much a scene out of a horror film. Like which alien. I really it was like liked. alien, yeah. but with an orc. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't saying cute little things or just like, you know, oh, maggoty bread again, any of that kind of stuff. I was just like, wow, this is really scary. And the, it was kind of funny in the shadow of uh, Prey, the way that he had that kind of helmet on and stuff. So it reminded me of the like proto predator type of thing. I was thinking the same thing. It's kind oh, of good. like Wendigo esque. I mean, that's also the design of a Wendigo is to have that like elongated cow helm or helmet. It's a Mm -hmm. skull, obviously, but wearing it as a helmet. Yeah. Holy cow. I mean, again, you know, I don't know where the Nazanin Boniati character and her interaction with Arondir the elf is going. It's clear that it's going to be running into these horrifying orcs. And I'm I'm really excited because that scene is fucking scary. Like I was not expecting it at all. And it's like a pretty good little microcosm of a horror scene in like four or five minutes, but not surprising because J.A. Bayona cut his teeth in horror movies. I mean, that's it's his bread and butter. I mean, he brought the horror movie kind of thing. He brought a little bit of it to Fallen Kingdom. I would point out the whole thing with the Velociraptor chasing them around that museum. It's kind of horror adjacent. Not as much as this is. This is just straight up horror. Yeah. And making orcs a threat. I think is a really great thing because they have been too easy to dispatch in the past because we're dealing with badasses through almost, you know, so many of the stories that we're dealing with. Right. These people in this show feel like real people in this world dealing with a threat that's going to need to be dealt with by all of them. And like, again, we talked about this on the last episode. Does the show bring everybody into the same net towards the end? Probably. I mean, that's the Game of Thrones thing, you know, kind of expand the net and then bring it in very close at the end in the final season. But it doesn't need to. It can be these pockets of resistance having their own stories, but they're all fighting Sauron. I mean, that's that, that's there's no question of that. But yeah, to make the orcs a threat is really interesting because I didn't know what to expect with the orcs on this show because they hadn't really shown them. They'd shown them, but they hadn't shown them. Mm -hmm. And this is a hell of an introduction for the orcs. I mean, that orc I seen in the fellowship is pretty good. It's not scary, but this is for sure. Like the first time I could say like, there's a horror element in Lord of the Rings, which is welcome for sure. Well, I'm curious if they're going to do a little bit of a better job differentiating between goblins and orcs because they tried to do a little bit of that in the movies, but they didn't do that great of a job. Yeah, I think in Hobbit, they run into all those goblins under the Misty Mountains, Mm -hmm. right? So yeah, I guess they're like short and squat. And then the orcs, and yeah, and the orcs and the orakai, I think are a problem too. But again, like that was a symptom of the way those movies were made. Like you mm-hmm. can't make like a million, you can't make like three different suits a thousand times. It's easier to make like one suit 3000 times type thing. Right. So I don't, I don't know what they're going to do. Cause I don't know what that thing is. Like, is it an orc? I assume, but they haven't even seen orcs. They, they talk about like, we haven't seen orcs in a very long time. Right. So what is this? Cause this seems a lot more, vicious than an orc maybe it's an orc that can't communicate with english because yeah by the time of the lord of the rings we know that the orcs can speak english to one another 
you know, like you said, maggoty bread, men fleshes back on the meal, you know, meats back on the menu, boys. I mean, all that's spoken in English. So maybe that's what it is. Cause you would assume if this orc pops out of the basement of this house, he's going to talk to them, right? Given that uh-huh. he's an orc and we've seen orcs talk. So maybe it's like this feral nature of the orc that's been introduced that makes them a more of a threat because they're less controllable. I don't, I don't right. know. I don't know. It's again, this is all like a very interesting because it's a very much a different world than we're used to, which is like, I understand now why the people who don't like this show don't like it. Like, I get why they don't like it. If that's what you don't like is that it doesn't feel like Lord of the Rings. It feels like something else, but good. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Right. Like it, it doesn't like if you want it to just be Peter Jackson's stuff again, that's fine. And it's there. It is the source Bible from which the show is written, clearly, at least from a tone and a visual standpoint. But like the show is allowed to make work scary and it's allowed to introduce actors of color. Like these are not things that people should be fighting. We should be saying, who cares if this is a thing that they're doing? Yes, they should be doing it. It doesn't matter. Like we should be casting actors for anything because it's Lord of the Rings. Jesus Christ, it's 5,000 years ahead. Like it doesn't matter. Like focus on the good stuff, the really good things about this show. Like uh-huh. they're actually doing a good job at exposition dumping in a way that doesn't feel ham-fisted. Like the scene between Elrond and Celebrimbor did a good job at kind of giving the audience an idea of where that story is going without being like bonk, rings of power, bonk, 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 rings of power. That's what I was <laughs> expecting, really. Like I'm surprised that the second interaction with Celebrimbor wasn't just launching into talking about the rings. Right. Yeah. He's just like, I have this plan in mind. He unravels a scroll and holds it up for Elrond and for the audience to see the whole thing. And it's like seven for Elvin. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> Three for. <laughs> right. Like a, a lesser show would go there. And that's, mm-hmm. and that's the, that's kind of, again, my biggest takeaway with this second episode is like, even though I would contend the first and second episode deserve to be put together, uh, Yeah, no, like these are really good episodes of a show that is setting some interesting groundwork for, again, I don't know what, because yeah, they're using the appendices as inspiration, but they can't use the Silmarillion. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yeah. I am kind of happy about the way that they have a little cliffhanger going in that Bronwyn story. Well, actually a little bit of two cliffhangers, really. So you've got, we see that disappearance of Aaron Deer. And the way that he's kind of snatched back by all those hands, that's pretty cool. And then we also have what's going on with Theo, which I just cannot ever hear his name without thinking of Bill Cosby. So <laughs> Theo with his Theo. Uh, <laughs> Theo with his big old sword, you know. Yeah. <laughs> his is again, we we that's they they don't go any further with that this episode. It's not it's well, not this made is the clear, one where like, the didn't... blood gets sucked into the sword and we right. see the the thing light up. Yeah. So mate I don't know if like the orcs were drawn to it because again like it's not true. Again it's not made clear. Uh, I like that the kid takes to beating the shit out of the floorboards the moment he hears a rat. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what the fuck, man? I have that was no weird. idea. I watched that scene two or three times. I was like, is there something I'm missing here? It's like, nope. He's just like, you rat. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I You're tearing your house up. Yeah, I think he's got some issues. I think he's being possessed by stuff. I mean, the way that, I mean, because that wasn't, I'm trying to remember who's uh, like, uh, barn it was that they found all that stuff in which was weird that they had all that stuff there and now it just yeah it feels like he's being captivated by that sword the same way like Gollum would be captivated by the ring yeah and hey you know what like if if they feel like they need to tell that story that's fine I'm not sure I care <laughs> yeah but if they make me care that's a different story I mean is Theo going to be Become a vessel for Sauron, maybe? Probably not. Will I they, don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with this guy. And I kind of like that, that I can't see, you know, I can't see into the future, not even the next episode. Right. I do like speaking of again, like subtle winks to the audience. Uh, Disa mentioning that in Casa Doom, it's best to know when to stop mining. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That was nice. Yeah. They took too deep. <laughs> I mean, again, that's. 
what happened in Casa Doom. I mean, they dug yeah. too deep, but they again, I it's it's weird to me. Like when you watch the Lord of the Rings, the original three movies, to see like hobbits interacting with a Balrog, that would be like us interacting with like space aliens. Yeah, like Balrogs yeah. are in in the time of the Lord of the Rings, the movies. Those aren't just myth. Those are like beyond myth into like legend like even like like some people probably don't even know about them like gandalf knows because gandalf's been around for a long time but like boromir and none of them are like what in the holy hell is this thing because again like it's just i like those subtle nods to the audience because again like that is a big thing that does end up happening and they don't have to mention it and i'm glad that they did but it does it is it could get a little much right it could could it's that it's that thing we were talking about last time. Where it's like, how did the you know, how did a hand solo get the scar? Right. Yeah. Just skirt that. Skirt that edge. It's a very fine line to walk. But so far, I'm happy with the way they're walking it. Yeah. And they're introducing characters and future plot lines, I think, in an interesting way, because the episode ends with a teaser for the person that saves Galadriel, who I'm pretty sure is a sealder. Which would make sense. I know he's in the show and he's a he's a mariner, which would track with his character. And again, like that's why the question that I had last time we recorded, which is like, how far before Sauron dying is this? Because Isildur is a Dunedine, but he's not immortal. So it'll be it'll be interesting. It's the same thing. Like I don't know who the guy on the raft is, but it feels like with his little thing that he had, his necklace. And he was just like, we, what was it? We have no king or something. He right. says like that. So it reminds me of like, you know, that there is no king of Gondor right now type of thing. I think, I think that's what's going on at that time. I, it would seem that Celebrimbor wants, and he's mentions it. He wants to start working on the rings within like eight months is what it seems like, like this, you know, in the spring. And it's like, dude, dude, slow down. You're an elf. You can take like 35 years before you even start this pro- right. project. Right. Which is in, and it's interesting. His reasoning is, you know, because they mentioned this whole idea of the elves came from Valinor and you know, like, ru- you know, wrecked havoc on Middle Earth because that's where they fought Sauron. Mm-hmm. Well, that's actually that's where they fought Morgoth. And in all of that happening, it's interesting that his like motivation is, I want to make something beautiful where we had done so much damage. Yeah, boy, Celebrimbor. Yeah, <laughs> if mean, you only knew, pal. I know, but I mean, it's. You know, you you look at, you know, the the way that invading forces go in and just knock things to shit. And then, you know, oh, we're quote unquote rebuilding. See ya. Bye. Right. We're making it better by making rings of power that then can be corrupted by one ring, Mm -hmm. which then rules the, you know, it rules and looms large over the kingdom for, oh, until the fourth age begins. So, yeah, it's it's interesting because, yeah, the elves are trying to make it better. And in trying to make it better with good intentions, they are going to make it worse than they could have ever imagine i mean it's Celebrimbor. his name should be cursed you know i mean we we always talk about il Suldur's bane but it's like Celebrimbor. you did a lot more damage i think well and again i mean he he attempts to right the wrongs i mean he's there fighting at the end with isildur and he dies you know isildur doesn't die but Celebrimbor dies so he ends up making good on that but they don't show him in the movie they don't show him in fellowship he's there mm-hmm. in that fight so you know it's elrond and Celebrimbor. so again it's i mean i know why they didn't show it but they could have they showed everything else they showed them getting the rings they just never showed the rings being created it's mm-hmm. almost it's almost implied that sauron made all the rings in fellowship yeah yeah it totally is Right. It's because kind of he's weird. He's the one who in in darkness made the one ring to to bring them all together and bind them. Right. Okay, right. sure. Yeah. So it's it's weird. But at the same time, like you're totally right. Like Celebrimbor should be like cursed. He's he's gonna he's going to he's going to in the process of doing what he's doing, wreak havoc for like two thousand years or something yeah. to like that effect. So yo, Calabrimbor, you're canceled, homie. Yeah, yeah you're out of here. That's canceled. What Nor- that's what Nori's gonna say in the finale. That's what Elon Musk is gonna say, actually. Oh cancel yeah. this yeah. guy with their woke Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I like how that's what this is. Like, can't just watch a show, like you 
Batman. Yeah. So, so mm-hmm. pathetic. Yeah. We can put white people into every role imaginable, but cast a person of color in anything. Suddenly it's woke culture. Yeah. How dare those wokesters? Yeah. 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 Speaking of wokesters, at the end of this episode, there is a- another cliffhanger. Do you know what's in that box? And no, it's not Marcellus Wallace's soul because I knew you <laughs> wanted to say it. I mean, it looked like the Arkenstone from the way that it was glowing, but I don't think that this is the right timeline, is it? No, it so it should be, I believe it should be Mithril, which is like oh, not okay. which is not discovered at the time until like this is around the time because Mithril is like a big deal. I mean, in Kazad oh, yeah. Doom, like that's what drives them to go into the Balrog's domain essentially by accident is by mining more mithril. Because I mean, again, like Gimli says in fellowship, if Frodo only knew, or I guess it's Gandalf, he says, if Frodo only knew how much that mithril vest was, which worth more than the Shire, which is always a really weird line because like, what does that mean? So maybe we'll kind of get that answered a little bit more in the sky in the span of this show, because clearly the introduction of Mithril is going to be important to everything that happens from here on out. Yeah. What they should do is they should melt the Mithril down and inject it into somebody's bones and they can have like claws made out of Mithril so and make, make shields this out of entire them? like weapon, <laughs> weapon X type of thing. <laughs> wow. They should do that. Yeah. 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 I mean, why, why not? not? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's interesting, though, because, again, like that, that's something that we kind of just don't think about. Right. Like Mithril, it's just part of Lord of the Rings. But at this yeah. point in the story, it's all it, it's it's in Khazad Doom. And that's the only place that it's found. That's why it's so hard to find. That's why Frodo's mm-hmm. vest is, you know, like two little rings of it is equivalent to God knows how much money in that universe. So like that's that's what's interesting about this is like, again, like I. I thought when I saw it first that it was a Silmaril because like that was, you know, that's kind of the way they're showing it. But I think, I think it's supposed to be Mithril because I I think they're like astounded by the fact that they find it. And again, like it's the, it sets into motion the downfall of Khazad Doom. So I, like I said, last episode, haven't read the Silmarillion for a long darn time. So when they're talking about the Silmarils and the beauty of them and that um, Morgoth uh, was just enchanted by them. What's a Silmaril? The Silmaril is it's it was created by the elves, and it's like a it's like a stone that all of the light in the world comes from. And I think there's like three of them. And oh, wow. Morgoth steals them, like he covets them and steals them. And then I believe again, I just people who listen to this can tear me apart. The Baron and Luthien story has to do with, I think Uh Baron going and retrieving the Silmarils from Morgoth. So, and like, it's, it's the whole doomed love thing. And there's, there's that component to it, but I believe that's part of the story, but the Silmaril, like there's always been the question, is the Arkenstone a Silmaril? I don't think Tolkien ever said that, but again, like it's, it's so important to the story of the Hobbit. And it seems like it could be because it's described very similar to, Mm. The Silmarils, and I believe in one of the books they mentioned the Silmaril, one of them is in the mountain. There's like one in the earth, one in the air, and and then one in the water. Mm. So they're just, I, I don't know how to explain it other than like it's it's a MacGuffin in a lot of ways. Like, but they're just like in the world, but they like represent the light of the world. And if you were to control all three, you could pervert the world in, in the way you believe, which I think is why Morgoth was going after them in this right. time that they talk about before the show. So kind of a natural ring of power. Kind of. Yeah. And so like to create the rings of power, that's why Sauron was interested in them, because, again, like it would give him power over more than even Morgoth had because he has direct control and he forces them to keep the ring on and never take it off, uh-huh. which is the Nazgul. So, right. Yeah, no, it's it's weird because there's a lot of stuff going on here that they don't explain. And if you like read into it, you can figure out more information about it than you would ever want. But I think it's doing a good I think it's doing a good job of giving like casual fans of the Lord of the Rings enough to get by on. Yeah. I'm enjoying it. I don't know a lot of this stuff. I mean, the way that you were talking about the dude that's on the raft, I'm like, okay, you know, maybe he's a Dunedain. I don't know, but you probably know like his whole backstory. And I'm just 
more of a casual dude on this one. I think I think the guy on the boat with with Galadriel is a created character for the show. Okay. So, so uh, Isildur's not obviously, but like the that was the other thing. Like the Harfoots, like some of them are created for the show, and people were getting all up in arms about that too. So you know, again, like they're they're doing a good job of like metering out the stuff that we know with a lot of stuff that's like just been left wide open up until this point. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm really in, I'm I'm enjoying the world building that the show is doing on top of the world building that the original movies did. And again, trying also to take into account, but not hew on uh, like immediately right into the books. Cause again, this show's allowed to do whatever it wants. It doesn't have to be the books specifically. Mm-hmm. So the only thing we really haven't talked about is the Nori storyline. And that's mostly because not a whole lot of stuff happens there. We get to see her father snap his leg or t- it, that really turned my stomach a little bit when he his foot twisted around like that. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, and yeah, the the stranger. So yeah, Tom Bombadil <laughs> there drawing all these little things, and then like the whole thing with the uh, uh, the lightning bugs and all that, and him creating. I mean, she was talking about a constellation. I'm not sure if it's a constellation or if it's just a rune or something. It's probably a constellation. So I'm just like, okay, good. Yeah, we're, we're keeping the fires burning here. Okay. Right. The, the weirdest part for me was that all the lightning bugs died after he used them. Well, and that's the, the question, because like there is also that moment when he's talking to her when she sees him for that kind of first time after she saves him, mm-hmm. where he's where it's black speech. And like Gandalf speaks in black speech in Fellowship and in Hobbit when Bilbo pisses him off. So, again, I don't I again, I know a fair amount having read what I've read this year, but I haven't gone and delved into everything. So I don't know what the connection to the black speech is with Gandalf and how that factors into his character. But, yeah, I think at this point he's talking to the Fireflies, which is a Gandalf thing that we've seen him do on not one, but two separate occasions in hobbit and in fellowship he talks to the moth on top of orthanc and he talks to the moth on the tree where they're hanging off of in the first hobbit movie and then we have the stranger talking to a moth and or a firefly and creating yeah the what's again a constellation so i think it's gandalf at this point obviously and yeah it's there's they don't do much because again i feel like they're more trying to meter out the information to those who maybe don't know who this character is yet and then probably I would wager, I don't know how you feel about this, but like the next episode, like either the next episode or the four, I don't think they can make it past episode four without giving him one of the names that Gandalf is called. Right. If not, right. if if not Gandalf Mithrandir, at least. Yeah. Or Stormcrow or something like that. Right. I mean, again, we don't know who, how the Harfoots would refer to him. Mithrandir is what the elves call him. Mm-hmm. So. You know, and yeah, we've seen Gandalf, Stormcrow, and all those, all the other names. So maybe the Harfoots have a name for him that we've never heard of before, which is maybe probably where they're going. Again, it, I hope to God, and I feel like I'm putting this out into the universe and now they're going to do it. I hope it's not like, oh, um, Nori Brandyfoot is like Frodo's great, 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 great. Uh. You know what I, and I was thinking about it when I watched the episode the third time. I was like, is that why? Cause she's like, because uh, there's this weird thing where she's like, I feel like he's coming here for me. Right. I need to be the one to save him. And she feels this weird connection to him. And we know in Lord of the Rings, Eru Iluvatar does work in mysterious ways and does influence the world in minor ways. And sending Gandalf to Frodo slash Bilbo's ancestors would be a little on the nose, but. If you believe that there is, if there is a God in this Lord of the Rings universe, which there is, maybe that's him working in quote, mysterious, unquote ways. That's a little lazy, but like, that was kind of, that was my only concern with that story is like, are they doing that? Yeah. Yeah. And I hope it's not like, you know, oh, uh, you always causing trouble around here, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Again, like, that's what I don't know is. Is is the reason Gandalf's with the Harfoots because they're go they are the proto hobbits, obviously, but is it because one of them is Frodo's? I mean, again, yeah. one of them is probably Frodo's ancestor just by sheer fact alone. Like we haven't seen any other Harfoot. So is this it? Are they it? Like if they are it, then one of them has to be. Right. So yeah. And I mean, I kind of like this whole thing of them being nomadic and they're just like, oh, we gotta get out of here. The fall's coming or whatever. And it's like, okay, cool. Nice. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, again, like they, they take things that we know and they kind of change them just a little bit to make them a, a little bit more interesting and, and kind of work more in this world where things are a little less set in stone, at least for some of the people that we're seeing, like not everybody is like city bound and sitting in, you know, Rivendell, like oh. Elrond's moving around and going places like Galadriel's going places. And these are places we've never even seen before. We've heard right. the gray Havens mentioned, never really seen even close to it. We've heard air. We've heard uh, a region mentioned at least once, I think in the original movies, finally seeing it. So like, they're showing us things that like, I never even thought we would see in the, in, in a adaptation form either. What was another neat thing was when the, uh, we didn't mention this last time, when the comet or whatever that uh, Tom Bombadil arrives in, that we get to see the ints as well. That was kind of a nice little shot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing we haven't mentioned because we didn't get to see it in the first episode, what did you think of the show's opening credits? Oh, I, I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, and I I don't know if I'm gonna be whistling any of these themes anytime soon, but you know, I was like, okay, yeah, this works. And yeah, it was it was interesting that they didn't have opening credits in the, the first episode and that they saved them for the second. Another reason why I'm just like, you hey, should have just thrown these two things together. Right. Well, and I'm I'm one hundred percent with you. Again, like that was why that was the other thing I wanted to say. Like the opening credits like felt weird that they didn't put it in the first episode. They kind of had a cold open too, so they could have done it like right after that Galadriel introduction. So mm-hmm. but the intro music's by Howard Shore. Nothing else oh, is. <laughs> Nothing okay. else is, but it is. So nice. there's that. Uh, and it it definitely sounds like it's it's kind of a shame that they couldn't get Howard Shore to do everything for the show because I think, and I don't think I we talked about this when we talked about the hell did we talk about recently? When we talk about something and we brought up Lord of the Rings leap motifs, but like oh. there is no better score really for movies. I think like, that might have been our first episode because we definitely talked about that. And I remember using that phrase, which I was very happy about. But like there's not there isn't any of that yet in this show. Not yet. I not mean, yet. It, Maybe there won't be yeah. even. Like I don't know. I hope there is, because again, it was such a big part of those original movies. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, uh, but the intro music's great. I like the intro, the credit sequence, I think is kind of interesting, you know, using vi- I get they're using vibrating plates with sand. At least that that's the cool. idea. Yeah, it's cool. It looks, it looks cool. I don't know if they're doing it practically, probably practical and digital. It's at some point it stops being able to be done practically, but it looks cool. And the, the music's good. And yeah, like, you know, it doesn't, most people are going to skip it after seeing it the first time. So well, it reminds me they did. Um, there's a show on YouTube that I watch called um, VFX Artists React, and they were talking about the teaser for uh, Rings of Power, where it was the um, the metal being poured in uh, the the kind of channels and seeing the metal moving around and stuff, and they're just like a lot of that was actually practical. So interesting. I was very surprised by that. I mean, it was definitely enriched with uh, some digital effects, but a lot of that stuff is real, real deal. So it's kind of smart the way that they're using, like, like you said, sand and probably digitally enhancing that as well. Well, I mean, that orc costume was real. <laughs> yeah, they found a guy that looks exactly like that. <laughs> no, I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> I mean that, that, that orc costume was not a digital effect like that was a practical no, effect that was I nice yeah don't know if they'll keep with that with the rest of the series but like i also appreciate that the show is working in the practical world a lot more than the hobbit feels like it was can you believe that they let a woman character kill that orc right and then cut off its head right oh my god and throw its head down and be like these fucking orcs man they're yeah. here I kind of like when she was just like, now do you believe me? Yeah. Come like, on. These fucking orcs, man. Yeah, no, I'm, I think of the storylines right now, that's the one I'm probably the most interested in because again, the dwarf one is just, it's, I, I, it's, it's taken my attention completely. Like anytime it shows up, it's fantastic. But that one is the one that I think has the most kind of intrigue to it. Cause like, I don't know what, what's going on with any of that and where that story goes. But if there's more practical orc effects, I'm all for it. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, again, like this show could have really fallen into some like nasty CGI traps already. And it really hasn't. So I, and again, like with a billion dollar budget for five seasons of a show, like I would hope not, but all's still good. It still looks really good. It doesn't look overly CGI. 
Yeah. So, Chris, do you know what we're talking about next episode? No, they haven't released the titles of these episodes, man. We're talking about episode 1.3. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand what Amazon is doing. Like, uh, well, it was so weird how they released these two on a Thursday night, and then the next one isn't until Friday. It's like, what? Why are you doing it? Set the date with the very first episode, set the date, set the tone, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I'm right there with you. I, it's very strange because we initially assumed it was Thursdays. And then I, we had to, we kind of had to reconvene and figure out uh, a better time because no, the show's coming out on Friday. So even though it came out on third, like you said, Thursday, the first two times it came out on the same day. So I mean, is it going to be Thursday or sorry, Friday at 12.01 a.m.? Or another, like, no, it comes out at nine o'clock on Eastern time and six o'clock uh, Pacific. Yeah, I, I hope it's just 1201 Pacific, like, because again, I, I don't know. That was the one thing about this that I feel like they bungled. And then they also, de- they also deactivated the reviews. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What the fuck are you well, doing, Amazon? bombed by these a holes. I don't get it. Like, even like when I pulled it up uh, on Google, it's like, three stars i'm like what what is happening here yeah well and yeah it's it's totally review bombing dickheads so that's fine i mean i get why amazon did it but like you're just giving him more credence by doing that like Mm -hmm. just weather the storm they'll like they'll go away eventually they'll run off to something else to get angry about the same dickheads that were mad about star wars same dickheads that were mad about x y is spider-man being african-american like Mm -hmm. go away there's no place for you here anymore nobody cares and the fact that like CNN and anybody else is giving them a platform, I think is just wrong. Like wokesters. Yeah. Okay. Elon Musk. Nobody cares about your opinion on Lord of the Rings. Like I don't, nobody cares. You didn't make the show. Nobody cares. No, we need to get away from giving news coverage to every a-hole out there. Yeah, every opinion doesn't need to be covered. And I'm not saying we need to like edit people, but I don't think everything anybody says needs to be given a spotlight. But again, the 24 hours news cycle will do that to you. So yeah, they get real bored. Yeah, right. When they're covering Lord of the Rings on CNN and how woke it is, they you run out of things to cover for the day, guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe hang it up. You yeah, know, I'm sure there might actually be things happening in other countries like Europe or uh, you Middle know, Earth, any, any place on the entire continent of Africa or, you know, the Ukraine. You know, there's still a war happening in the Ukraine, Chris. But there's a war happening in Middle Earth right now with. Orcs. Oh, yeah. So and we better cover that instead. <laughs> we, we say as we cover this show and not other important things. <laughs> It's okay. Our medium is podcast. Our medium is entertainment. This is not, we're not pretending to be news. That's fair. That's fair. But I feel like we could pretend to be news more successfully than some of those folks. (laughs) Definitely. Yeah. So yeah, no title for the next episode. Sorry, everybody. You're just going to have to wait and see. What if the title is just Gandalf? (laughs) 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 Yeah, that's what we should do. Since they haven't given us a title, we should just prognosticate. What's the title of the third episode of this show? Oh, I mean, that is where they're starting to get very flowery with this. Well, I I, I have to say Adrift was pretty lame, but a shadow of the past, you know? Oh, my God. It might be like um, uh, a a bell rings in the distance or something like that. I don't know. Uh, uh, Drumming in the deep. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I I think it's going to be something Mithril related, if not just titled Mithril. So, Mm. like, you know, or like, I don't know, like something Mithril related is kind of what I'm prognosticating. It's either be Mithril related or Gandalf related, like some sly, like Mm -hmm. maybe Gandalf's name, the Mithrandir. I'm sure me, I don't know what it means off the top of my head, but I'm sure it means something. So maybe that'll be his name or something. I don't know. That again, you're right. Like, that's, and that's a, that's a, tv contemporary tv thing where it's like these like very subtle nods and like sly like winks to maybe what the episode's about or like a a thing and i mean westworld does that game of thrones did it any contemporary tv show worth its salt is going to name an episode something other than episode one the guys find mithril (laughs) (laughs) the dwarves find mithril (laughs) um yeah that would be great yeah (laughs) yeah i yeah Green Man will be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, why not? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, we will be back 
as soon as we possibly can with our next episode. Until then, please go on over to iTunes or wherever you get this podcast, rate and review the show. It would help people know that we actually talk about things that are current and newish rather than just talking about things from the 1970s, which is where I like to spend the most of my time. Yeah, I was about to say, this is this show is pretty outside of our normal content wheelhouse, especially with the like scheduling around of our schedules, pre-existing schedules to make this happen. So yeah, if you're liking what we're doing, please uh, rate and review on iTunes because we're going to be probably doing this through all five years of the show. God knows how many years of real life that will be. We'll be ending this show in like 10 years, I bet. I bet that's what I, I bet. I bet 2032 is when this show ends. Give them two years in between each season. Yeah. So wow. we'll be doing we'll be doing this for a while. So yeah, rate and review it on iTunes because we might not be doing it every week, but we'll be doing it through the run of the show. Until then, Chris, what are you working on these days? Watching movies and working on other various podcasting endeavors over at cstashu.com, C-S-T-A-C-H-I-W.com. That's my link tree. Go there for all the things that I work on, which are by myself and a lot of other things with you, Mike. So speaking of that, where can people find you? You can find me over at the Projection Booth, which is available at projectionboothpodcast.com, where I've got links to all cool graphic for this, courtesy of you. I'm going to put that up on the website and have people link gone over there and they can uh, check out me talking about something current and rather than like i said a 1970s cop show or a failed 1980s sci-fi show or a mm, okay middling let's say uh horror show from also the early 70s what do you know nothing new that's what i know apparently (laughs) this is the newest thing we've talked about together in a long time yeah yeah, you used to have me on the culture cast when you were covering new movies. That was kind of wild. I'd go out and see something on a Saturday and talk about it on a Sunday. I know. We haven't done that in a long time. This is what this feels like that in a lot of ways. So this is like when we covered uh, Jack, Jack Snyder. Jack Snyder, you know, Jack Snyder. Jack Snyder, yeah. The Justice I, League. I know. Yeah. Justice League. The Justice League, yeah. <laughs> Zack Snyder's <laughs> failed attempt at filmmaking. Yeah. Yeah. Brought to you by the Trolls. Please. Brought to you by Warner Brothers, who also brought you this. The same people that are are uh, out there reviewing Rings of Power, all the the troll army, yeah, all the bots, yeah, good stuff. <laughs>